Today, I'm gonna to be reviewing the Sony FX30 from the perspective of a wedding filmmaker and telling you if it's a good camera for you to purchase if you want to use it for weddings, documentaries, or other events, and you need a camera that can film fast. Hey, my name is Matt Johnson, and before we get started, for the sake of ethics, I want you to know that this video isn't paid or sponsored by Sony, and while they did loan me this camera so I can make this review, they won't see this video before it's uploaded, and this camera is going to be shipped back to them very soon, and I'm kind of sad about that. Also, because I respect your time, I'm going to spoil the conclusion of this review right now and tell you that the FX30 offers nearly all of the features of Sony's dramatically more expensive FX3 at almost half the price. And if you are a newer filmmaker with a smaller budget, this camera is a fantastic choice. That's not all though, because if you are a more experienced filmmaker that already owns an A7S III or FX3, for example, the FX30 would also make for a fantastic B or C camera for wedding ceremonies or other angles. So it's awesome. Conclusion over, let's actually review this camera. <laughs> Starting off then with the body and build quality. The FX30 body is virtually identical to the FX3, and it is to the point that whenever I first saw the FX30 in person in New York City when I was hanging out with Arthur R, who had just gotten one, I was shocked because I told him, nice FX3, and he said, nope, this is the FX30. What? That's crazy. So one warning I would have for you is that if you happen to have both an FX3 and an FX30, make sure that you're paying attention to which one you're grabbing in your camera bag, because you may find yourself surprised that you thought you were reaching for a full frame camera, but then end up with a crop sensor. This similar body and styling of the FX30 compared to the FX3 reminds me a lot of how the a7 IV looks very similar to the a7S III, even though it's $1,000 cheaper. Sony's able to save money by using the same design and tooling for multiple camera bodies. And for you, as a filmmaker, if you learn how to use the FX3, you're also gonna be able to easily use the FX30 as well, and vice versa. So this design language can be very helpful. Overall, because the FX30 shares a design with the FX3, it's a very well-built, very high-quality camera. You get the same flip-around screen as you would find on the FX3 and A7S III, and while this is great, now that I've had the opportunity to get my hands on the A7R5 with its screen that's capable of tilting as well as flipping out, I really wish there was a way to retrofit this on every other Sony camera, because I would pay for that upgrade in a second. So to be clear, I'm not saying that the flip around screen on the FX30 is bad by any means, it's still great, but it's just not quite as magical as the a7R5. On the side, you get a full-sized HDMI port that does support external RAW recording, which is fantastic to see on a camera of this price. And I think this really helps position the FX30 as a competitor to some of the options from Blackmagic if you want to rig it out. Personally, for weddings, I prefer to film with a camera that is as lightweight as possible, so I don't put a cage on my camera or use external monitors or recorders. But I love that the FX30 gives you this as an option if you want to build it out to record raw. Also on the side you have micro USB as well as a USB-C port with the USB-C port capable of powering the camera for as long as you need it to as well as enabling you to use the camera as a very fancy and rather expensive webcam. You also have a mic jack as well as a headphone jack but do you really want to use this mic jack? You can if you want to, but the star of the show and the reason you may not want to is the optional top handle for the FX30. Yes, unlike the FX3, which comes with a handle regardless of whether you want it to or not, Sony has given you the choice of whether you want to invest in a handle, and by doing so, enabled you to save a good chunk of change that we will talk hard numbers about in a little bit. So if you are a new filmmaker with a smaller budget or you're looking for a B or C camera that you can throw on your tripod for a wedding ceremony, who needs a handle for that? Not you, save your money. This handle is just like the FX3s where you can screw it into the hot shoe mount at the top of the camera and immediately gain access to two XLR inputs that you can record with directly into the camera, as well as tons of controls for your audio levels. I love this handle, it's sturdy, it makes the camera easier to hold, and while I wouldn't recommend keeping it on your camera all day, especially if you're gonna be filming with a gimbal, if you're filming, say, a wedding ceremony or a talking head documentary and you want to be able to record great audio directly into your camera, this 
handles great. Another area where the FX30 is similar to the FX3, and this is something that differentiates it from Sony's other mirrorless cameras, is that this camera also has a fan in it. Yes, next to the ports, you can see this large vent running down the side of the camera here, as well as a smaller vent here on the bottom. And the benefit of this fan is that you are essentially guaranteed to never have to deal with a camera overheating. Of course, make sure that you still go into your Sony settings and set the temperature to high heat, and then you're good. No need to worry about overheating. And don't worry either, in my testing, the fan is essentially silent. If you put your ear right up next to it, you can hear it blowing, but I wouldn't worry about hearing it on a film set or wedding, even while filming the quietest interview. Lastly, in regards to the body of this camera, if you will turn your attention to the other side of the FX30 now, you will see that this camera has dual memory card slots, just like many of Sony's newer cameras. And I'm so pleased to tell you that unlike the a7 IV, which was oddly limited, where it had one card slot that could be used for both CF Express and SD cards, both of the FX30's card slots can be used for both CF Express and SD cards at up to V90 speeds. It's just like the FX3 and A7S3, I love it, and I'm frankly a little surprised that Sony was able to make these work at the price point that they hit with this camera. If you film weddings like me that are one take events, using dual card slots is so important and I highly recommend it. You will be protected in the event that one of your cards dies mid video. Diving into the menus of the FX30 now, we have a lot more similarities to talk about because just like with all of Sony's other cameras that have come out in the past couple years, the FX30 has Sony's new menu system that it also includes the quick access functionality that we've seen on the FX3. In addition, all of the software functionality that Sony has added to their newer cameras, like the a7 IV, is also present in the FX30. So you get things like focus breathing compensation, which is still mind-blowing to me, by the way, because it completely eliminates focus breathing with any of Sony's native lenses. Likewise, you also get the focus map feature, which is great for manual focus and will enable you to use a colored overlay to tell you exactly what is in focus. These features are great, but it's also at this point where I'm going to echo what I've seen Philip Bloom and Gerald Undone complaining about, and that is that Sony really needs to add software features like these to their other cameras via firmware update. It's crazy to me that you could buy three FX30s for less than the cost of one Sony A1, and these cheaper cameras would have more software features than Sony Sony's flagship. And hey, as someone that films primarily with the Sony a7S III, I would love to see these features on my main camera as well. Anyways, complaints over. We have other similarities to talk about. Looking at the autofocus, the FX30 has the exact same phase detect autofocus system that you'll find on the FX3, a7 IV, a7S III, etc. And it is very fast and very reliable, and I absolutely love it. Likewise, the FX30 also has the exact same in-body image stabilization system that you'll find in the FX3, which means that you have the standard as well as active stabilization mode that will crop in 1.1 times, but make your footage even more stable. While I don't really have any complaints about the IBIS in the FX30, I will mention that the newer Sony a7R5 has an even better IBIS system that was scary good whenever I tested it. And if you want to see the results of those tests and whether you should throw away your gimbal, because it's actually getting close to you being able to do that, I will link to that test video up here in the corner and down in the video description. What other similarities do we have now? Oh yeah, batteries and battery life. The FX30 uses the exact same batteries as pretty much all of Sony's newer cameras ever since the a7 III. These are the NP-FZ100 batteries and they are great. In my testing, I found the FX30 battery life similar to my a7S III's battery life and I would expect to go through three to four batteries on a longer wedding day. Keeping on the similarities train now, the FX30 also has the exact same picture profiles and bit rates as Sony's other new cameras, meaning that it's capable of recording XAVC-S, XAVC-HS, and XAVC-SI all in gorgeous 10-bit color, as well as giving you access to all the picture profiles that you would expect from a Sony camera like S-Log3 and S-Cinetone, which means that it's going to be very easy for you to match your FX30 footage to all of your other Sony cameras. Another nice profile 
feature that has been great to see Sony pull from their other cameras in their cinema line, like the FX3 and FX6, is the addition of Cine EI mode, which makes filming in S-Log3 even easier once you learn how to use it. You can comment down below if you want to see me make a tutorial about Cine EI mode and I can work on it. You also get the custom LUT preview option from the FX3 as well, where you can install your own color presets onto the camera and use them to preview how your footage is going to look after it's been color graded. This is a huge help when filming. Side note, all of the FX30 footage as well as all the other footage that you're seeing in this video has been colored with my color presets, who is Matt Lutz, which work great with the footage from all cameras, including Sony cameras like the FX30. So if you want great colors, especially if you're filming in S-Log3, I will link down below to my color presets. Anyways, lastly, you have similar frame rates that the FX30 is capable of filming in that match up with many of Sony's other newer cameras as well. You get 4K at 24 FPS, 4K at 30, 30, 4K 60, and 4K at 120. And the frame rates at up to 4K 60 are all oversampled from 6K, so it's very sharp. Oh, and you can also record in HD at up to 240 frames per second. That's cool. Remember when the FS700 could only do that for like eight seconds? Technology, we've come so far. Anyways, back to that 4K at 120 though, because there are some caveats. Namely, if you choose to film in 4K at 120, there is a 1.6 times crop, meaning that your footage is gonna be significantly tighter, so you're gonna need wider lenses to compensate. But that's not all. Because what I haven't really mentioned yet, aside from one mention toward the start, I think, is that the FX30 has a crop sensor. And this is where we need to talk about some of the differences of the FX30 versus Sony's other full frame camera options. Most shockingly though, especially whenever we talk about the price point of this camera in a little bit, there are really only two big differences between the FX30 and many of Sony's other cameras. The first, as I just mentioned, is that crop sensor. Yes, unlike the a7S III and FX3, which have full frame sensors, the FX30 has an APS-C size sensor with a 1.5 times crop. This means that any lens that you put on this camera, you're gonna to have to multiply the focal length by 1.5 times to get the true focal length of the lens. So in essence, a 24 millimeter lens, for example, that would be a true 24 millimeter on a full frame camera like the a7S III will be a 36 millimeter lens on the FX30. 30, or a 50 millimeter lens on a full frame camera will suddenly be 75 millimeters. What this means for you as a wedding filmmaker is that you're going to need to be very careful whenever you're selecting your lenses, because you're going to need to purchase wider lenses than you would need to if you were filming in full frame, unless you want to be filming much, much tighter. If you watch my Sony a7 IV review, you'll know that that camera has a 1.5 times crop whenever you film in 4K 60. To compensate for that then, I recommended using a wider lens like a 16 to 35 millimeter, which with that crop will essentially turn that lens into a 24 to 52.5 millimeter. I would recommend doing the same with the FX30. This doesn't mean that you necessarily need to purchase a 16 to 35 millimeter lens, which, spoiler, the f2.8 version of that lens costs more than the cost of this camera, but you do need to be more creative creative with your lens choices to make sure that you do not find yourself filming too tight. All this said about the crop though, there is a workaround that I do want to mention, and I haven't seen other reviewers talking much about this really because this technology has kind of fallen out of fashion with how many cameras are full frame these days, but I do think that the FX30 is a great opportunity to revive the conversation around Speed boosters, yes, speed boosters, AKA focal reducers. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, imagine that there was a piece of technology that you could put onto your crop sensor camera, like the FX30, and you could not only turn the FX30 into a full frame camera and remove the crop, but you could also gain an extra stop of light being led into the sensor, which improves the low light performance. Does that sound insane? It sounds insane. Even now, a good 10 years after I first used a speed booster, I'm still kind of mind blown by the technology. So of course, I had to test this out. Here is the FX30 with a Sony 24 millimeter lens on it, which makes it 36 millimeters. And now, throwing my old Metabones EF to E-mount speed booster on the FX30 with a Canon 24 millimeter lens, dang, it just got a lot wider. This is so cool. Of course, keep in mind that when you use a speed booster, you're going to lose access to the fantastic autofocus performance that you may be used to with a Sony camera. So you're going to most likely need to manually focus for everything. But 
if you are looking for a more affordable way to turn your FX30 into a full frame camera, a focal reducer could be a great way to do that. I personally used a speed booster setup like this for many years with my Sony FS100 and it worked great. Anyways, so the crop is an issue and definitely something you need to keep in mind, especially if you're considering purchasing this camera because the crop is going to affect all of your lens choices that you purchase. Likewise, there's one other big difference between the FX30 and Sony's other cameras that you need to be aware of. And this other difference is the low light performance of the FX30. Yes, not only does the crop of the sensor require you to heavily consider which lenses that you purchased to make sure that you're getting wider options, it also requires you to think about how much light those lenses are going to be gathering. It's simple physics. The sensor of the FX30 is smaller, so less light is going to be hitting it, which means that this camera is not going to be as good in low light as pretty much all of Sony's other full frame cameras with larger sensors. This low light performance is a really important factor for you to consider if you're a wedding or documentary filmmaker, because the odds are that you most likely will not have full control over the lighting at a wedding. You will need a camera that can compensate for those darker wedding receptions and indoor ceremonies, which is one of the biggest reasons that I've recommended cameras like the Sony a7S III and FX3 and avoided cameras like the Panasonic GH5, which notoriously struggle in low light. Let's talk about low light performance for the FX30 then. The first thing you need to know is that just like the a7S III and FX3, the FX30 has what is known as a dual gain ISO sensor, meaning that there are two ISO levels where the camera looks its best in low light with minimum noise. When filming an S-Log3, the first base ISO is 800, which aligns with most of other Sony cameras, but the second base ISO is where things start to differ with the FX30's second base ISO at 2500. This isn't terrible, and I'm sure that there are filmmakers that are still using the GH5 that are thinking, dang, 2500 is great. But whenever you consider that the FX3 and A7S3 have a second base ISO at 12,800, those cameras are dramatically better in low light. Numbers aside though, in my testing and looking at the actual footage that I filmed, the FX30 still performs very well in low light. If you're filming a dark wedding reception or in a darker church or a documentary that you have to film at night, as long as you're using prime lenses with wider apertures such as f1.4 or f1.8, etc., you still should be able to film great footage. The main thing to keep in mind is that unlike the a7S III and FX3, where you can walk outdoors in the middle of the night and say, oh look, the moon is out. I'm ready to start filming. I've got plenty of light. You're going to need to invest in lights for the FX30 that will help you with the brightness of what you're filming. And honestly, that's a good thing. You should always be purchasing lights, regardless of which camera you're using. Even if it is the best possible camera in low light, you're still going to want lights to help enhance the scene that you're filming. Lastly, we need to talk about the price of the FX30 because I love how aggressive Sony were with their pricing. And I love that they give you options to help make this camera even cheaper. Unlike the FX3, which comes with a top handle that you are required to purchase, Sony has now made that top handle optional, which drops the price of the FX30 considerably. With the handle, you're looking at spending 2200 bucks at the time of making this video on the FX30, but without it, the price goes all the way down to 1800 This price is very competitive compared to other cameras, and I love to see it. If you're a filmmaker that does not have a big budget to spend, I would skip the top handle and go with just the camera. It's my understanding that Sony will allow people to purchase the top handle separately in the future, but whenever I looked around online, I only found the top handle listed on more obscure websites. I didn't see it available on B&H, for example, but that could just be because the FX30 is so new and the supply chain hasn't caught up and started shipping it yet. Alternatively though, the camera's hot shoe is a multi-interface shoe, so you can buy Sony's XLR K3M audio adapter, or if you have an FX3, the handle from that camera will work with the FX30. So let's wrap up this review then. In conclusion, the FX30 offers essentially all of the features of Sony's dramatically more expensive FX3 at half the price, with the only concessions being a smaller sensor size and worse low light performance. I'm still frankly shocked that Sony did this and I'm honestly so impressed. For context, whenever I bought my first DSLR in 2009, it was a Canon 7D. 
That camera had a 1.6 times crop sensor, maxed out at 1080p resolution, but it could do 60 FPS in possibly the grossest binned down 720p. It had no video autofocus, no picture profiles, no IBIS, horrible 8 bit color, and awful dynamic range, low light performance that makes the GH5 look decent, and it almost overheated on me while I was filming a talent show. I still love that camera, and I used it to film everything for about four years. If I was a new filmmaker today, and I knew that I could spend only $200 more than the $1,600 I spent over a decade ago, and I could get this much performance, this many features, and I could have a camera that would easily slide into an ecosystem where I could purchase higher end cameras and lenses that would complement it well, it would be a complete no brainer to me. So, if you are a new filmmaker, quit your searching, buy this camera, you're going to absolutely love it. Alternatively though, if you're a filmmaker that has already been filming for a while and maybe you already own an A7S III or FX3 and you're thinking about purchasing a B or C camera that you could use to film wedding ceremonies or as an extra angle for documentary interviews, etc., or you just need a extra camera for your assistant filmmaker that you're bringing along, I would bet that you're looking at the price tag of the FX3 and A7S III and thinking, dang, do I really want to spend that money? Maybe I should buy a Sony a7 IV, even though it might overheat on me and I don't really need the photo capabilities of that camera. Well, here comes Sony with possibly one of the best B or C camera options that you could get in the FX30. The body is the exact same as the FX3, which makes it easy to learn. The colors, autofocus, picture profiles, menus, everything that you already know from your other cameras are going to match this one. Heck, you could just use this as a wedding ceremony camera. And you know what you always need for a wedding ceremony? You always need to get closer. You're always buying longer lenses, like a 70 to 200, so you can get closer to the couple. Well, guess what? The FX30 has a crop sensor, which is gonna get you 1.5 times closer to the couple without you needing to buy a longer lens. And if you really wanna melt your beard here, the FX30 is literally $1,000 cheaper than Sony's new 70 to 200 Mark II lens. You could literally buy this camera and then have a thousand extra dollars to spend on a cheaper telephoto lens that could still get you closer than the 70 to 200 due to the sensor crop. That's crazy. And it's so cool. So, do I love the FX30? Yes, I love the FX30. Will you love the FX30? I think yes. Lastly, before you go, I would love to help you out even more. If you're a wedding filmmaker or thinking of getting into wedding filmmaking, this is a review for wedding filmmakers after all. I've put together a free guide called YouTube Tips for Wedding Filmmakers. And this guide is gonna show you some of the steps that you can take to get more views, likes, and bookings from YouTube for your wedding filmmaking business. You can download it completely for free at the link down below. Thanks so much for watching and have a great day. Bye.